Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's November 20th. Today, we celebrate the garden writer and gardener who turns 91 years young today. We'll also learn about the man who created the world's smallest rose garden. We'll recognize the lost work of an American botanist and painter, and we'll salute November with an excerpt from a book by an American historical crime novelist. We grow that garden library today with a fantastic book about the arts and crafts movement, which gave us wonderfully inspiring homes and gardens. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a misnamed plant, and it's too late to change it now. But first, let's chat about subscribing to the free Friday newsletter for The Daily Gardener. All you need to do is head on over to the website. It's at thedailygardener.org. Don't forget to spell gardener correctly, G-A-R-D-E-N-E-R, and make sure you're heading over to .org and not .com. In any case, once you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get a Friday update from me with some personal pictures of my own garden, some little house plants and things that I have going on here in the house. I'll also share some garden-related items for your calendar. I'll feature all of the Grow That Garden Library books for the week. I'll give you some exclusive gardener gift ideas and garden-inspired recipes that I think you'll enjoy. And then you'll also get some behind-the-scenes updates regarding the show and more. Plus, don't forget that every week, one lucky subscriber will win a book from the Grow That Garden Library bookshelf, which is completely overflowing by now, as I'm sure you can imagine. And also, don't forget that I love seeing your garden pictures, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth. So if you're going back through your photos or you just want to reminisce a little bit, go ahead and send me those photos. I love that. My email address is jennifer at thedailygardener.org. Here's today's curated news. Today, I selected a piece that was written by Helen Newling Lawson, and it was featured in The Family Handyman. I loved the title of Helen's article. It was called, Things I Wish I Knew Before Planting Fall Bulbs. Great title and great post. If you have planted fall bulbs this year, especially for the first time, or if you're planting them again, you're giving it another go, and you haven't had success in the past, maybe check out Helen's post. See the tips that she's offering. If you want to do that, all you need to do is head on over to the free Facebook group for the show because I share all of my curated news articles and original blog posts right there. It's in the listener community. It's a free Facebook group, and it's called The Daily Gardener Community. So you don't need to take notes or search for links while you're trying to listen to this show. All you need to do is head on over to Facebook, and the next time you're there, search for The Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend, and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the 91st birthday of the garden writer and designer Penelope Hobhouse, who was born on this day, November 20th, 1929. When Penelope visited Tuscany, she was captivated by the villa gardens, and she began teaching herself garden design. So there's inspiration for you. A 2016 article in the New York Times said Penelope is, quote, a fixture in the minds of gardeners who love rooms and bones, the paths and walls, and satisfying verticals that form the skeleton of a garden. Hear, hear. Penelope has designed gardens all over the world, including a garden for Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, at Walmer Castle in Kent, an herb garden for the New York Botanical Garden, 
and an English cottage garden for Steve Jobs' Woodside Home. Gardens Illustrated recently shared a post featuring six of her garden design principles. And I thought I'd run through an abbreviated version of that right now with you. First, Penelope says, think about backgrounds. Large trees can be used to frame the sky. Hedges provide vertical and horizontal lines, as well as a background for planting, while small trees with broad, globular, or pyramidal heads act as ceilings. I love that. Low continuous hedging can be used to frame pathways. Then she suggests to create a strong framework. Penelope says, I tend to create a strong structure or framework for my gardens with looser planting within. The architecture can be supplied by buildings, walls, steps, and pergolas, but also by plants. Great idea. Then she says, don't overuse colors. The cardinal rule for planting is to use bright colors sparingly. Form is much more important than color, and flowers are fleeting. So start instead with the shapes and hues of trees, hedges, and shrubs, and the leaf form and color of herbaceous plants, the shape they make, and the height they grow to which goes against all of our first instincts, doesn't it? Because we always are attracted to color. And so often we think about that first and we completely go crazy. And the next thing you know, our garden just looks like it's a complete hodgepodge, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to follow Penelope's advice, don't overuse colors. Start thinking about shapes and forms instead. Then Penelope says to mix plants up. Choose plants that will not only do well in any particular spot, but will also associate happily with any neighboring indigenous plants. Great advice. Next, she says, repeat, repeat, repeat to help unite the house and garden and create flow. Repeat hard or soft features. And you know, that repetition in the garden ties it all together. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to take some of your favorite aspects from the front of the garden and bring it to the back of the garden and so on, vice versa. And finally, Penelope says, don't forget it's for you. Gardens should provide shade and shelter, seats for contemplation, scents and solitude, and require just the right amount of maintenance to encourage relaxation because after all, they are places to be enjoyed. And I love that Penelope ends on this note because if we work like dogs in our gardens and we have nothing left, we often can end up feeling resentful about our gardens and that's a terrible place to be. So don't do that. Don't overwork the garden Back off if you did that this past summer, if you threw yourself into your garden, uh, if you were a little overzealous maybe because of the pandemic and now you're too poop to pop and you just need a break, take the break and learn from it. And next year, scale back a bit. Now, despite all of her achievements, gardeners find Penelope relatable and personable. Remember, she made all of these fantastic gardens, and she was entirely self-trained. In a recent video, Penelope said, I'm still finding my way. So relatable. And today is the anniversary of the death of the Oregon Journal columnist and gardener, Richard William Fagan, who died on this day, November 20th, 1969. As gardeners, we celebrate Richard for installing the world's smallest rose park, Mill Ends Park in Portland, on February 23, 1954. The installation coincided with Rose Planting Week. Richard's Mill Ends Park 
is just 18 inches in diameter, and it was named after Dick's Column, which was also called Mill Inns. The name for the column Mill Inns came from Dick's passion for collecting little bits and news items about the Pacific Northwest sawmills. And so that's how he came up with the title for his column, Mill Ends. In fact, the mayor of Portland once joked, I don't know why anyone would invite me to talk on city affairs. Dick Fagan can tell you more. Mill Ends Park is really just a small plot in the middle of an empty lamppost hole on a cement divider on the street at the intersection of Southwest 1st and Taylor Street. That year, in 1954, the city of Columbus, Ohio, claimed the title of the Rose City, which was an honor held by Portland for over 50 years. Now, that made Portland gardeners pretty upset and they began planting roses all around the city. Hearing about the competition with Ohio, Dick got the idea for the Littlest Rose Park after spying the empty spot in the road divider from his window at the newspaper building. Dick's Mill Inns Park consisted of a single rose bush, a little wire fence, and a small wooden marker that said, Mill Inns Park. So cute. And it was on this day, November 20th, 1989, that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch shared an incredible story called Buried Blossoms by Patricia Rice, which shared the story of the long-lost work of the botanist August Henry Kramer. Here's what it said. After 40 years in basements, Kramer's collection of 493 botanical watercolors was scrutinized by two local art appraisers. You might imagine that art appraisers become blasé about seeing another beautiful painting, but not Barbara Messing. They took my breath away, she said. Flowering mint... California poppies, hummingbird sage, wild parsnips, whispering bells, rare alpine flowers seemed almost fresh on the paper. Each had been meticulously painted from live botanical specimens by August Henry Kramer in his spare time as a fire lookout in California and Oregon. Kramer was born in South St. Louis but he spent his adult life in the Western forests. Shortly before his death in the late 1940s, he brought his paintings to his sister in St. Louis with careful notes detailing the care of the delicate watercolors. Kramer's great-nephew, Art Hack, does not know precisely when his great-uncle died or where he was buried, He packed Uncle Gus's box of watercolors each time he and his family moved. Then he said, every once in a while, I would take them out and we would look at them. A few years ago, Jean Hack, Art's wife, and a volunteer guide at the Missouri Botanical Garden, took her husband to an art exhibit of botanical drawings at the garden. They immediately reminded Art of his uncle's work. He wrote about the paintings to the garden's director, Peter Raven, who sent two staff members to look at Kramer's work. When the appraiser, Barbara Messing, pulled the paintings from their brown paper wrappings, it was the very first time they had all been seen outside the family in 40 years. After a couple of hours of looking at them, She felt hot tears flowing down her face. She said, each drawing was so beautiful, it made me cry. In unearthed words, today's words are from the American historical novelist Martine Bailey from her book, A Taste for Nightshade. The next morning, I had to get outside 
and so began a period of long walks in the park. Early November continued bright, with the last sun of the year shining low and coppery over the woods. Striding through heaps of rusty autumn leaves, I ached to see beauty dying all around me. I felt completely alone in that rambling wilderness, save for the crows cawing in their rookeries and the wrens bobbing from hedge to hedge. I began to make studies in my book of the delicate lines of drying grasses and frilled seed pods. I looked for some lesson on how best to live from nature that every year died and was renewed, but none appeared. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Gardens of the Arts and Crafts Movement by Judith B. Tankard. This book came out in 2018, and the topic is a favorite of mine. In this book, the landscape scholar Judith Tankard shares the inspirations, elements, and evolution of garden design during this iconic movement. Judith handpicked homes and gardens from Great Britain and North America to show the diversity of designers who helped forge the arts and crafts movement. I love reading Judith's work because she does such thorough research, and then she presents everything she's learned with great clarity and passion. Whether you're an architect, student, a garden designer, or a hobbyist, Judith's book offers a compelling narrative explaining how this period of garden design is still relevant to how we create and understand landscapes today. Gardens of the Arts and Crafts Movement features celebrated artists such as William Morris and Gertrude Jekyll. Readers will benefit from Judith's diligence in collecting visuals like photographs, period paintings, and garden plans to convey all the important elements of the movement. This book is 300 pages of the best examples of the arts and crafts movement with Judith as your expert guide. You can get a copy of Gardens of the Arts and Crafts Movement by Judith B. Tankard and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $25. Great book. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, November 20th, 1933, that the Knoxville Journal shared a story called Department Botanists Agree, Too Late to Change, Les Padiza Was Named in Error. Les Padiza is a genus of around 40 species of flowering plants in the pea family, commonly known as bush clovers. The article pointed out that the mistaken identity dates back to 1803 when the French botanist Michaud bestowed the name to honor the governor of Florida named Les Pedes, who allowed Michaud to explore Florida as part of his botanizing efforts for France. But in studying the early history of the plant recently, a botanist by the name of P.L. Ricker with the USDA couldn't find a governor by that name in Florida state history. By checking the old histories, records revealed that the governor in 1788 was actually named Cespedes, not Lespedes, making it clear that the name given by Michaud was either an error or a misprint. Botanists of the department agree that it would be a mistake to try to correct the mistake now, if for no other reason than it would lead to confusion with a family of tropical trees, because they are called Cespedesia, and they're named in honor of an early professor of botany, also named Cespedes. 
So there you go. We're stuck with less Fadiza. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.